Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about uh, an important topic, actually probably one of the most important topics um, that hasn't been covered a lot in uh, recent times, resilience. Let me tell you a story, because as you all know, anyone who knows me knows that I love telling stories. One day, Musa السلام, who is one of the greatest prophets, we all know him, and he's known throughout history, was standing giving a khutbah. And while he was giving the khutbah, one of his congregation, one of the Bani Israel, asked him, who is the smartest man in the world? Who is the wisest, most intelligent, smartest man in the world? Naturally, Musa السلام, thought that it was him. He's not just a prophet, but he is one of the Kubar prophets, one of the biggest, one of the greatest prophets. And he said, of course, myself. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reprimanded him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked Musa Islam, how did you know? How do you know that you are the smartest? Who told you that you were the smartest person? And Musa Islam became uh, contrite and he said, then who is the wisest person on the planet. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed him someone who we now know as Khidr. So Musa salam, decided that he wanted to meet this person. Who is this person that is so intelligent, so wise, that is even wiser than the Prophet Musa salam. So he went out to go and meet this person. And after a long and difficult journey with many ups and downs, eventually he found him. When he found him, something strange happened. Anyone, any normal person who would meet a prophet would be overawed and would love to have a chance to meet a prophet. But when Musa Aysam approached Khidr and said, asked him that, may I, you know, and I'm paraphrasing here from the words of the Quran and the words uh, that are used, that he said, can I spend some time with you? I want to learn from what, the knowledge that Allah SWT has given you. What was his response? No, no, you can't handle what I know. SubhanAllah, you know, if someone even said that to us today, I think it would be very difficult for us to handle. Even someone more intelligent than us told, you know, if we went to a professor, someone said, no, I'm sorry, I can't tell you the answer to this. You're not smart enough. You can't handle this. We'd be very offended. Like, give me a try. Imagine saying that to a prophet. But that's exactly what happened. But in a, in a sign of prophethood, the humility of Musa Isa, instead of getting angry, instead of becoming indignant and saying, what are you talking about? I can't handle, I can handle talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but I can't handle listening to you. What are you talking about? None of that. He asked again and Khidr gave him a chance. I'll give you a chance, but don't ask me questions. So they proceeded on their journey. And on their journey, Musa Aysan and Khidr, they get to a river and they need to cross over to the other side. But they don't have any money. They can't pay any of the, the people who own the boats or the ships. They couldn't pay any of them. So none of them would take them aside. And one poor fisherman with a rickety boat, he said, come on guys, I'll take you guys across. You don't have any money, it's no problem. Don't worry, I'll take you across. I'm just doing my good deed for the day. And they get on the boat and they get to the other side of the river. As soon as they get to the other side, Khidr takes his foot and smashes the boat, a hole in the boat. Musa Sam goes, what? What are you doing? This person literally just took us across. He's, he did it as a favor. Nobody else is doing us a favor. He did us a favor. You broke his boat. Khidr responded and said, I told you. I told you, didn't I? You can't handle what I know. And Musa Sam said, forgive me. I forgot. I won't do it again. They continue on their journey. And as they continue on the journey, they need some directions. You know, there's no Google Maps in those days. There's not even a map in those days, right? Where do we go? Which way do we go? And a child says, I'll show you the way. Helpful little boy comes, shows them the way, this way, that way, go this way. And once he's shown them the way and taken them a little bit of the way and they're on the right path, 
Khidr kills him. Straight up murder. Now this story is not long longer, it's no longer a, a nice little story. Oh, what's the story? This is child murder taking place right here. This is scary stuff. Now, Musa Aysam, again, like any human being would feel, it's like, what has just happened? What did you just do? This is a kid. This is a child. He helped us. He showed us the way. What have you done? Khidr said again, I told you, you cannot handle what I know. Musa Aysam, and again, in the sign of a patience that almost only a prophet could have, is says, if I ask one more time, then I will go. Leave me. This is my last chance. And so they proceed together. After some time, they reach a town. They're hungry. They're tired. They have no money. Even now, if someone turns up into a town, they're hungry and they're tired. Until recently, it's, with, it's, it's a part of hospitality that you should look after your guests. That you should have, you know, in, in the olden days, they had caravan sarai, like places where people would go and rest. And it would be, it would be up to the town to look after them. They're our guests. You know, traditionally, Islam, in Muslim culture, you, a guest can come and stay with you for three days before you even ask them why they've come. But in this town, psh, get lost. You don't have any money, we're not giving you any food, we're not giving you any shelter, get lost. Who are they telling to get lost? To Musa, Isam, and Khidr. So they're resting, hungry and tired. When Khidr looks at a wall and he goes, you know that wall looks like it's going to fall. I'm going to fix it. So he fixes this wall. Musa, Isam was just like, what? I, I don't understand you. This town, they treated us terribly. And you're fixing their wall for free. Why didn't you even just try to take some money? You could have said, listen, I'll fix the wall for some money and then we'll buy some food with that. You didn't even do that. You just fixed it for them. For nothing. Khidr was like, I told you, you can't handle what I know. And then he told them the answer for these three stories. Well, the answer, he goes, that fisherman who took us across, what you didn't know was that there is an evil king that's coming and he's taking, commandeering all the vessels around. And he's going to take all the ships. But I, because I broke this fisherman's ship, he's not going to touch his ship. He's, why would he want a broken ship? So he's going to leave it. It's just a small, it's a small break. The fisherman will be able to fix it in a few days and he will have his, his own boat. Everyone else will have lost their boat because the king's taken it. And that little boy, what you didn't know, was this little boy, who looks so sweet and innocent and helpful right now, was going to grow up to be an evil tyrant. An evil tyrant. A curse upon the humanity and a curse upon his parents. So, I finished him now so that he never grows up to fulfill that, uh, that evil. And he remains an innocent, pure soul who passed away now and his parents will never be hurt by what he was going to become. You know, it's like that he's going to grow up to be Hitler. You know, do you kill baby Hitler or do you not? And then the third story, this town is a town full of evil people. But in that town, there was a good man. And he died young, leaving his children orphaned. He hid his wealth because he knew that in the town, the people were evil and they would steal the wealth of his orphaned children. So he hid it under this wall. And this wall was shaky, so if it fell down, the wealth would be exposed and the people would grab it. So I rebuilt it again. It will stand again until the children are old enough, and then they will break the wall and take their wealth and have it, and no one can grab it from them. What is the lesson for us from this? What's the lesson? Why am I telling you this story? What's it got to do with anything? Brothers and sisters, there's a reason Wallahi, if you keep looking for signs that Islam is the truth, keep reminding, because are there not lessons? The Quran keeps on saying, for those who reflect, right? Are you someone who tadabbars, who reflects, who ponders on the signs of Allah in the Quran? The Prophet ﷺ said, he who recites Surah Kahf on Friday, Allah SWT will shine a light for him between the two Fridays. 
Every Friday, we are supposed to read Surah Kahaf. We're encouraged to read Surah Kahaf. Why? Because one of the reasons is because of this story. This story of Musa, Isam, and Khidr is a story of what? It's a story of resilience. What's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaching us? He's teaching us, no matter what difficulty you go through, whether it's a loss of your material wealth, like the fishermen, whether it's a loss of your physical health or someone loved one to you, like the parents of that young child, whether it's a loss, uh, whether it's being taken advantage of, like in that town of the evil people, whatever you go through, you don't know your full story. You do not know. You only know one chapter of your story. And that chapter might be a very difficult chapter. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the entire book of your life, the entire book of your whole existence. And He knows what is going to come after. He knows what is coming later. He knows that what He has in store for you, inshallah, is better and greater and bigger than you could ever imagine. So be resilient. No matter what trial you're going through, be resilient. No matter what tribulation you're going through, be resilient. Because resilience is from the characteristics of a Muslim. And, rem and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to read this every Friday because every Friday you need that reminder. Every week, life beats you down, right? You got the Monday blues. Life hits you hard, right? There's that saying by that famous philosopher, Mike Tyson, everyone has a plan until I hit them in the face, right? Everyone comes in with a plan to fight Mike Tyson and then he smashes them in the face and all their plans disappear. Well, that's what happens with humanity, with all of us every week. And then, and then what happens? And then we read Surah Kaf and we remember. This is only part of it. Why resilience? Why is this topic being chosen? Well, of course, we're going through COVID times, right? And COVID is a big test of resilience, resilience of the whole country and of organizations and of businesses and of individuals. What's our resilience like? We, you cannot hide now behind great this and great that and big companies and all these things. You can't hide. COVID makes, it all, makes us all open for what we really are. So why this topic? Because obviously COVID is here and it's affecting all of us. But also because this generation, your generation, is being accused of being snowflakes. You're accused of people being people who have no resilience. You cry at the smallest things, you create issues, and you, you throw your uh, toys out of the pram. That's what you're accused of, which I think is very unfair. Every, every generation accuses their next generation of being, of being losers, of being weak, when it's not true. It's not true at all. It just means that you have a different set of challenges and a different way of dealing with those challenges. But that's why this is an important topic for us to deal with because it's, an, it's a very pertinent topic, especially for all of you who are running Islamic societies. Right now, you, I, will, I would not blame you for being worried, for being like, how am I supposed to manage this? We don't even know what's going on. Lockdown, no lockdown, lectures online, not online. How are we gonna, are we, we can't meet people. How are we supposed to connect? How are we supposed to get people into the ISOC? How are we supposed to do any events? What's gonna happen? I don't blame you for feeling like that. That would be natural. If you didn't feel like that, maybe there's something wrong with you, right? But this is why this topic is there. Resilience, what is resilience, my brothers and sisters? Oxford Dictionary says it's the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, toughness, right? But what's the real definition? What does it really mean? What's the real definition of re resilience? Wallahi, resilience means so many different things. It means, let me put it in plain English. It means if you're going through hell, then keep going. Don't stop. It means that you're of those people when difficulties strike, when you're struggling, you're someone who makes moves, not makes excuses. Resilience is about being someone who can be knocked down by anyone. You can, you know, somebody could knock you down. Anyone can knock you down. But only you have the power to keep yourself down. And you realize that. Anyone can knock me down, but 
No one else will keep me down. I will, inshallah, always stand up. And that's the difference between being a champion and not being a champion, right? It's not the number of times you get knocked down. It's making sure the number of times you get back up again is one more time than the number of times you get knocked down. That's what resilience is. Resilience is about going through a dark tunnel. Look at this picture. What do you see? Do you see any light? Do you see no light? You're going through a tunnel of difficulties. You're going through obstacles. You're going through fear. But you keep going. Why? Because you have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have faith. You have belief that one day, if you keep going, one day the small flicker of a light will turn in the distance. And you will keep going, inshallah, until that small light becomes larger and larger until you get through the other side. That's what resilience is. Resilience is, there's a famous quote by Muhammad Ali. It isn't the mountain ahead to climb that wears you out. It's the pebble in your shoe, right? Resilience means that you could see any challenge, any mountain of a challenge, and you, could, you, will, you will go for it, inshallah. So what, I need to climb Mount Everest? Somebody else has done it? Why can't I? I'm not less of a human being than them. But also, the pebble in your shoe doesn't get you down. That's what happens to the majority of people, unfortunately, right? I can't take part in ISO, too much politics. Ah, I can't take part, too many meetings. Ah, too many this, too much that. I don't like him, I don't like her. This excuse, that excuse. That, so many excuses. Resilience means not the pebble or the mountain will defeat you, inshallah. And speaking of pebbles and rocks, what's the difference between a rock and a diamond? What's the difference between a rock and a diamond? They're the same thing. But the value of a diamond is immeasurable, right? A diamond is passed through from generation to generation. A diamond is, is possessed and is coveted. A diamond has value. A diamond is, is, you know, is, is beautiful and then everything around it is beautified because it's a diamond. But a rock is thrown on the floor and it's forgotten. What's the difference? A diamond is a rock. The difference is a diamond is a rock that has gone through intense heat. It's been in the kitchen, right? Intense, thousand degree heat. And it's come out the other side. A diamond is a rock that has gone through intense pressure, severe pressure, the kind of pressure that would crumble other things. And it's gone through the other side. A diamond is a rock that after the heat, after the pressure, it has been cut to beautify it. And each cut the diamond endures makes it more beautiful, makes it sparkle more. My brothers and sisters, what is that if not you all? Be the diamond. Embrace the heat. That is what is turning you into a diamond. Embrace the pressure. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you pressure, then be grateful because that means that He has given you the ability to deal with that pressure. Because our Lord is not unjust and He does not give pressure to those who cannot bear it. Then be grateful because that means He has given you the ability to deal with that pressure. And every cut that you get, whether it's a cut from within the eye sock, outside the eye sock, from wherever you get, Every cut makes you more beautiful, makes you a more valuable diamond, makes you more precious for the ummah. So you have a choice. Do you want to be a pebble or do you want to be a diamond? And you must translate this choice to your eye socks, to your, to your friends, to your compatriots. Tell them that this is our opportunity. Under this pressure, we are not just going to make uh, uh, a, a survival year for the ISOC. This year, we're going to quadruple the membership of the ISOC. This is the year we're going to do the most amazing events. This is the year we're going to reach out to the most number of people. This is the year that we're going to do what we could never have imagined. And when you make dua for Allah subha to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, this is an important lesson. Don't be just those people who ask for ease. Oh Allah, Make my affairs easy for me. Yes, you should do that. 
we should, we don't ask for difficulty, we don't ask for problems, but also make, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for broader shoulders to be able to deal with those difficulties. Ask not, this is a quote, JFK quote, ask not just for uh, smaller problems, but ask for greater, broader shoulders to deal with them. Now, many of you will be thinking, you know, basically what I'm saying is, man up, man, just get, just, just deal with it. You're not allowed to have any mental problems or you're not allowed to be anxious. You're not allowed to get upset. You're not allowed to feel scared. You're not allowed to... That's not true. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not telling you that you need to be invincible. I'm not telling you that you need to be Superman. I'm not telling you that you need to be someone who cannot ever struggle. But what I am telling you is do not be like the oak tree. The oak tree, it fought against the wind. The massive, great, beautiful oak tree fought against the wind until it was broken like this. But be like the willow tree. The willow tree bends in the wind. It bends almost backwards. It bends in every direction, but it never breaks. It never breaks. Be like the willow tree. Bend as far as you have to. Take a break. Take your time. Get friends. Do whatever else that you need to help yourself so that you can last for the long run. Bend as far and as long as you need to, but never break. That is resilience. This is not resilience. My brothers and sisters, I want to give you, I want to finish off with three practical tips for you all. Because I don't want to just motivate you. Three practical tips that you can have to increase your resilience. Number one, remember your history. Remember, number two, remember your death. And number three, remember why. Very briefly, what do I mean by remember your history? Brothers and sisters, rem you have to, one of the big problems in the Muslim world today is that we're not aware of our Islamic history, of our legacy. We're not aware of those who have come before us. And because we're not aware of that, because we don't realize we're, we're on this fantastic team, then we drop the ball. Remember that you are part of a legacy. You are part of the same team. If I told you, if, if I told any of you right now that you are joining the, you know, uh, Liverpool, Man U, or Barcelona football teams, you know, you would feel the legacy of wearing that shirt, right? You would feel the importance that, oh my God, walking onto that pitch. You would feel it because it's real. Well, you are part of a greater team than they will ever be. You're part of a team and on that team has started off with the prophets. Those were the first members of that team. Literally from Adam, Aysam, from the first prophets down to your parents were the most recent members of the team. Islam has come down to us, has reached us not by accidents or by chance, but through the sacrifices, the hard work, the resilience of every single person in this uninterrupted chain of humanity from Adam Islam to you, there has been this ball of faith has been handed down one by one by one by one. People have suffered, people have died, people have gone to prison, people have... <coughs> <clears throat> lost their families, people have given up their jobs, people have done everything to get Islam to you today. Don't drop that ball. If you are aware of your history, then you are much, much more likely to be able to be resilient. You will be someone who wants to, who realizes that you are part of something big and you want that you want to, you're not going to let, you're not going to be the one, you're not going to be the missing link. You are not going to be the one that lets anyone down. Number two, remember death. There's a fantastic quote from one of the shiuch who said, if you need an enemy, and many of us, you know, some of us, we were very quick to fight and very quick to get angry and very quick to blame people. If you need an enemy, then your nafs is sufficient. Because you, you will find no greater enemy in this world than your own self, than your own nafs. 
Before you fight anyone else, fight yourself first. And when you win against yourself, then see if you can fight anyone else. And if you need a reminder, then death is sufficient. Remember, this is a saying, the Prophet ﷺ said words to the effect, remember often the destroyer of pleasures. The Prophet ﷺ used to remember death 70 times a day. Do we even remember it once? And I used to, you know, when you were small, you think, really, 70 times a day? You know, if anyone told me, uh, you know, I've been thinking about death like 10 times a day, I'd be like, my God, what's wrong with you? Are you, are you depressed? Is this, are you worried? Now I realize, you know, subhanAllah, death, if you look at it in a morbid way, then all you get is the morbidity. But if you look at it as a motivational tool to make you resilient, subhanAllah, nothing is better. When you realize that your time is running out, the clock is ticking. When you imagine the things, the regrets that you have when you're in that space, and the, the, the last the plank is put up across your body, and then the, last, and the soil starts to drop. Imagine it. Get imaginative. I want, one day, inshallah, I want to do a talk just on death, just on the, how you can make it real to you. Imagine who's going to bury you. Think about it. Who's going to wash your body? And when you start thinking like that, it motivates you to think, I don't have time to waste. I don't have time to make excuses. I have time to do work. So remember death, because when you remember it, it makes you resilient. It makes you stronger. Excuses go out the window. And finally, remember why. What is remember why? This is the most important thing. This is that point that everyone talks about, Nia, right? What do you mean, Nia? What's your intention? Stop asking everyone about their intention, guys. It's really like, the, you, if you read in the, read the books of uh, Sirah, if you read the books of Hadith, the number of times that they talk about Nia is less than the number of times you hear about it on any average ISOC. What's your intention, brothers? What are your intentions? Renew your intention. Guys, for God's sake, are you, how are you going to rip open somebody's heart and look inside their intentions? Because that's the way it sounds like half the time. The number of times, trust me, is without fail every year I get asked about my intentions. What's your intentions behind it? Your intention is to raise money. Your intention is a competition. Your intention is to free mix of girls. Like the number of things, the number of times every year people, like I get 18 year olds telling me about my intentions. When actually this is, an, this is about yourself. Not to, this is not for a chance for you to, you know, quiz someone else on their intentions. On yourself. This is for yourself. A reminder, what is, why are we doing this? Because if we remember why we're doing this, then we're going to do it for the right intentions, inshallah. Why are we doing this work? Why are we involved? When you do that, it makes you resilient, subhanAllah. And of course, the number one reason we do this is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the number one reason, because we do this to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is a very good point. He who has a why to live for can bear almost anyhow. When you have the why, when the why is clear for you, everything else becomes easy. Wallah al-Azim, look at it, my brothers and sisters. Our brothers and sisters, the Rohingya brothers and sisters, why did they get thrown out of their country? Why were they raped and murdered? And why was genocide inflicted on them? For one reason and one reason alone. Because of Islam. And yet, in those same refugee camps, in their difficult situation, these children put on the cap and they pray and they make dua. Think, think about it. This is the Uyghur, sorry, it's miswritten. The Uyghur brothers and sisters, why are they being put in the concentration camps? For what? Because of Islam. Because they say that Islam is a disease and they're trying to cure this disease. That's what, the, that's what we, they're being told, right? And yet they go to the camps in their millions, but they will not give up their Islam. What about 
in, in prisons from left one part of the world to the other. There are Muslims who are struggling and they're there. They've given away their entire lives for what? For the sake of Islam. And this, if you want to see a picture of resilience, this is the picture. A reporter went to, into a Syrian refugee camp and he interviewed different refugees about what was their one possession that they treasured position that they brought with them to the camp. Everyone had a different thing. This young widow with her two young children, orphan children, when, they, when he asked, what is your prized possession? She took out her only possession in this world, this Quran. And she said, this is my treasure. When I have it, I will never feel alone. That is resilience, my brothers and sisters. And if they, if they're in, in the camps of the Rohingya and in the, in the camps in China and in the camps, in the refugee camps in Syria and in, in Kashmir and everywhere across the world, if they can go through what they're going through and hold on to this deen and not give up, how can we give up? How can we give up? How can we make excuses? How can we complain? If they can do it, then we can too. If they can survive, then we can thrive for them, inshallah. And if they are going to keep holding on fast to the rope of Allah, then we must unite for them as well. My brothers and sisters, in Islam, the whole religion is a religion of resilience. No matter what happens, the shahada is resilience, the prayer is resilience, zakat is resilience, fasting is resilience, and hajj is resilience. I will finish with this last point because I know I've gone over time. I met um, two brothers um, who came back from hajj. I spoke to one of them and I said, how was your hajj? And he said, it was terrible. It was difficult. Um, you know, we got cheated every step of the way. The, they, they said it was going to be a five-star accommodation. It was four-star. The bus that was supposed to come, it didn't come. So we had to walk like two miles in the heat. And, it, you know, like at a very slow pace. So we literally were walking for five to six hours. The food was not very good. I became sick. People were pushing and shoving. It was a very difficult experience. I asked separately, asked the other person, how was your hajj? And he said, subhanAllah, it was amazing. It changed my life. I, I, I really, I think of myself and I think of my ummah in a different way now. And I, I, feel like it, I've, I've, I feel like I've been born again. I feel like I've been given a second chance to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to make a take this chance to be not only a better Muslim for myself, but be, be better Muslim for my community as well, to help others as well. You know what the amazing thing was? These two brothers were on the same group. They were in the same group. They went through the same experiences. But one focused on the negatives and the difficulties and the obstacles, and the other focused on the end result and the goal, the why. That is resilience. Don't let anyone stand in your way. Don't let anyone block you. Don't let anything be an obstacle. Think a hundred ways, think a thousand ways, how we're going to do it. Be inventive, be innovative, be intelligent, and be hardworking, inshallah. And I finish with this very last point. When Abu Bakr, you know when Abu Bakr passed away, the Muslim Ummah was in complete shock. When the Prophet died, they were in shock. But they had Abu Bakr Danhu to calm them down. When Abu Bakr Danhu died, who was there to calm them down? They, they were so upset and they were so tearful, except one. They were standing around his body and they were crying. Everyone was upset, except one person. You know who that was? Aisha radiallahu anha, his daughter. And you know what she said? She said, let him rest. Wallahi, 
when I read those words, I felt like crying. For a daughter to lose her dad, but the words that come out of her mouth is let him rest, will tell you how hard the man worked in his life. Radiallahu anhu. Will tell you how much he gave for the sake of Islam. Will tell you that he left nothing in the tank. That when he went, when he died, it was a chance to rest. My brothers and sisters, when you die, inshallah, when your time comes to an end, then I hope that everyone around you says, let the person rest. They have served their deen and their creator nobly. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the resilience to continue this great effort that you are embarked on that will make the difference to many, many, many lives, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the ability to continue and to strive forward. And no matter what comes in our way, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiply our friends, divide our enemies. May Allah make us successful in our endeavors and make this year the year not that we go backwards, that we accelerate forward more than we have in many a year in the past. Which is Akla Khair. Jazakallah khair for that talk. Uh, I say it's really important uh, um, to, that we learn about uh, resilience and uh, changing our mindset, especially during these times. Uh, so I do appreciate you giving us some uh, some examples of uh, things that are happening around the world as well, uh, so we can gain a little bit uh, a little perspective. Um, uh, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions uh, from our participants and also uh, just to remind you that uh, if you have any questions to ask, you can use the Slido platform. If you go on your phone, uh, slido.com, and type in the, the code at the bottom of the screen, uh, inshallah. Um, so I do have uh, one question, uh, uh, doctor. Uh, one of the questions is, is saying, often we go through pressure, asking why me? Um, why did I join during COVID year, et cetera? Uh, how, do, how do you overcome these thoughts? Um, it's a very good question. Um, you know, Islamic is not a good question to ask why me? Uh, or what if, if we we're encouraged to not that, do that? Because when you do that, it only leads to depression and saying, if I, if I had done this differently or I have done that differently. Whatever was going to happen to you was never going to miss you. And whatever is going to miss you was never going to afflict you. So try not to ask why me. Um, and when you do, actually look at it as an opportunity. I, I remember there was a, a scholar, he was giving a talk and he said, Alhamdulillah, we lived through the time, the best time, one of the best times in history to be a Muslim. And he just put it in his talk uh, and it was a talk about something else. And when he left, I literally ran after him. And I said, I have to ask you, he goes, what? And I said, you said that we live in one of the best times it is to be a Muslim. That makes no sense to me. What are you talking about? It's the worst time to be a Muslim. We're like the most oppressed or the most illiterate and so on and so on and so forth. How could this be the best time? And he said, uh, and you know, I was younger, so he put his hand on my shoulder. He said, SubhanAllah, you know, he goes, in the old days, you could have been someone who was a great intellectual and you could have written 20 books for Islam. But down the road, there would have been Imam Bukhari who wrote 20 more books than you. You could have been someone who discovered the cure for 10 diseases. But down the road, would have been Ibn Sina who discovered the cure for 50, 500 diseases. You could have been a great warrior. But you live in the time of Salah Adin, So you're nothing, right? You've done good, but there's always someone better. He goes, today, even if you do something small, you will join the ranks of the greatest of our Muslim heroes. Because when you're at the lowest point, at the darkest hour, even the smallest activity, even the smallest victory is multiplied many times over. He goes, we have an opportunity to be amongst the greatest generation. Remember, this is, you know, like the Prophet the Hadith of Prophet said that, you know, he missed his brothers who are like 50 of the Sahaba. So this COVID is an opportunity. It really is. Believe me, those who've taken benefit from this opportunity, like I've seen myself, five years worth of work in five weeks because of what the opportunities are given to us. COVID is not a curse. It's a lesson that we must learn from, but it's also an opportunity that we can benefit from, inshallah, to really take our ISOCs to the next level. Inshallah. And uh, I do have another question. Um, 
knowledge is so accessible to us, yet it uh, also seems so difficult. How do we reconnect with our history and heritage? You had a very good point there, that uh, no, information is more available than ever before. You, as an individual, have access to more hadith than Imam Bukhari ever had in his lifetime. Right? You have access to the internet, which has more on it than maybe Imam Bukhari ever read in his lifetime, even though he read millions, but you can read mul multiple millions. Right? But the, you don't, we don't have a fraction of their knowledge or their wisdom. So, how do we inc increase our knowledge? It's first of all starting from a position of humility and saying that information is not knowledge and that we want to gain that. There are many scholars who have this knowledge. There are many um, Islamic institutes and also learning from those who, are, who have gone down this road before. If you are a new ISOC president, speak to the older one. If you are someone who is, uh, if you're an ISOC, speak to like FOSIS because they deal with multiple ISOCs. Uh, you speak to your seniors, speak to your parents. Gain experience, gain knowledge from where it is because knowledge is a lost property of the believer. And, uh, but the first step is acknowledging that we don't have all the answers and let's try to start building that. It's there, inshallah. The Islamic history, there are mashallah, many now websites uh, and books that are available. So start somewhere. And then, you know, they, they, there's that saying, the best way to eat a whale, one bite at a time. Take that first bite, inshallah. The second bite is easier and the third and the fourth and you get easier and easier as time goes on. Oh. And uh, do you have any book recommendations for us uh, to rediscover our Islamic heritage and history? There are many. Uh, and it's a, you know, when it comes to that. But my, my first love, and I would recommend to you all, is Sira. Uh, and I say this because I know a lot of us think we know the Sira but we, we really, we only know the Maghaziyat. What does that mean? You know about the battles, about the Prophet Sallallahu but what happened in between the battles? What was the difficulties that the Prophet Sallallahu and the Sahaba went through? What was their attitude? How did they deal with different things? How did they deal with racism, right? It's, in the, it's there. Don't learn it online. Don't learn it from social media. Learn it from the Hadith. Learn it from the Sirah. How did the Prophet Sallallahu deal with misogyny? How did the Prophet ﷺ deal with injustice? How did he deal with his team letting him down? How did he deal with coming up with a, a decision? Shura, how did he make Shura? So, so it's all there. Re there's so many different books of Sira. You, if you take one and you don't enjoy it, don't worry, find another one and find another one. You, don't, you wouldn't stop eating at a restaurant just because you went to one and you didn't like the food and that's it, I'm never gonna eat at a restaurant again, right? There are thousands of Sira books. Read them, you'll find one. And when you read it, get into the zone. Imagine that you were there. And believe me, there's nothing better. That, I mean, the rest of the Islamic history will come. But this, you will find the answer to every one of your ISOC problems and your uni problems and your life problems in the Quran and in the Sunnah and, the, and in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, I've got another question as well. Uh, where did you personally study Islamic history? Me, myself? Y yourself, yes. I, I grew up, I was very lucky where I grew up in, in uh, Riyadh. Um, so as the, the school I went to was an Islamic school. They taught from, literally from grade one. They taught, taught us Islamic history in English, Islamic history in Arabic, uh, social studies. So we learned about every single Muslim country and their, you know, like, Sudan and uh, what kind of crops they grow in Sudan and the white revolution of Iran and all these kind of different things. So we were very lucky I had a, uh, uh, this background and my, my father also uh, is, uh, teaches Islamic, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a doctor as well, but he, he's a very good interest in Islamic history. And, um, uh, and from a variety of teachers and uh, books, subhanAllah, you know, if you want to learn from people, read their books. They put their wisdom in the books and uh, Someone asked a scholar, where is Islam and who are the Muslims? And he said, Islam is in the books and the Muslims are in the ground. Islam is in the books. That's where you find is, is, you know, uh, Islam because the, sometimes what, you, what we see in real life is, not, is, is Muslims. And you know, Muslims can struggle and they can do good and they can do bad. But Islam is in the books. 
and the Muslims, the real Muslims, the ones that want to follow their examples, they're already in the ground now. So follow their examples. Inshallah. And uh, I have one last question uh, for you. Uh, uh, so someone is asking, uh, do you have any advice on how to escape the inferiority complex faced by so many young Muslims in the West uh, and push ourselves to thrive as a community rather than uh, just survive? Jazakallah. We don't want a superiority or inferiority complex. We want to be, you need to understand who you are. You need, if you don't understand who you are, you are the top 1% of the ummah. Not even the top 1%, probably the top 0.01%. You are educated, living in security, and you have relative wealth. Even though you don't think you're rich, but the phone or the computer that you're listening to this webinar means that you have more wealth than more than 50% of the ummah. So, when you think about who's going to solve the situation in Palestine, there's no Salah Adin going to come on a horse and save us. It's you or nobody. When you think about what's, who's going to solve these problems of injustices, who's going to educate the 45% of Muslims who are illiterate, 45% of this ummah is illiterate, who's going to change the fact that 90% of all Egyptian women has said that they've been sexually harassed on, in, in public transport, 98% of our sisters? Who's going to change the fact that the top 10 most corrupt countries in the world, 8 or 9 out of those 10 are Muslims? Who's going to change this? It's going to be you. And when you realize that you are the hero of your own story, then, inshallah, you won't have an inferiority complex. You have this burning sense of desire, inshallah, of carrying on this mission, this noble task that the Prophet ﷺ is entrusted to you and the others have entrusted to you and so on. Inshallah, you will have that. And uh, I have a short plea. Obviously, we have freshers coming up. So, you know, keep trying to get them on board. There are many ways that you can do this. I've been telling, you know, I, I, I think people have been trying quizzes and maybe they're not working. Be inventive, try different techniques, get the rest of the uni on board. Um, you know, be the people that connects because everyone in university right now is kind of like looking around and saying, how is this going to work? It would be amazing if the Muslims came up with the answer. Hey guys, we want to bring everyone together just as a, uh, a as a icebreaker event, and we can do it in an Islamic way, so that we you know because we're the ones we're the hosts uh, online or in a virtual platform. Similarly, if you have other events like Charity Week coming up, you know we're pivoting to a we're pivoting to an online platform. This is a chance for us to get. You know, some people are like, uh, how can we do events? We can't raise any money because we don't have any events. We say, no, 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 no. That's not the way that we're going to do it. This year, because we're online, you're gonna, we're going to get our parents involved. Because before, our parents, if they wanted to get involved, they'd have to come to our campus. If my campus is in London and my parents are in Blackburn, they're not going to come. Now we can get them involved. We can get the imam down the road involved. We can get the whole community involved. This is going to be bigger than ever before. It's changing that mindset, inshallah. So that, you know, how can a Muslim feel inferior when we have the greatest treasure that uh, anyone in the world has, which is this deen? And you re keep reminding each other, inshallah. If you're by yourself, by the way, you will struggle. And like that oak tree, you might break. But together, you are like a forest of those willow trees. You may bend what you'll bend together, and no one will be able to break a forest on their own. No wind has ever come that has ever uprooted an entire forest. Jazakallah khair, uh, doctor. Uh, I think that was, uh, that was a very good, uh, very good answer, and uh, really concludes the talk uh, very nicely as well. As it's, uh, it's very important that uh, we do keep uh, resilient and uh, make sure that our mentality, mentality is strong. So I would like to thank you for uh, for coming today and attending our and giving a very wonderful talk. That's been personally very useful for me, and I think it'll be useful for many others as well. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair for having me and apologies I went over time.